Hey there, kids. Welcome to our last lecture of the year. It's unfortunate we can't be doing this live, but uh, this is the best we can do. Uh, so, lecture 13, lesson 13 lecture notes here. Um, kind of make it a little bit smoother. I just went ahead and filled it out all together before I even get started, so I can just talk through it, and then you guys can email me questions if you have any. All right, so uh, we're starting with a 3D curl field. So you can see there's a formula for the 3D curl field up top. Um, basically, each part is talking about the curl with respect to a specific plane. Um, to calculate curl field by hand, use our Dell operator and the cross product of the field itself. So remember that Dell is uh, dx, dy, dz, and we have our div field there as del dot field. So this is an example of finding a curl field for a given field here. This is a real basic field, and you can see as we do the cross product. Everything cancels out to zero, which means this is a gradient field and it has no rotation, no swirl. We, call, we say it's irrotational. There's other words that um, other people in the math world use as well, but for the most part, I think in our class, we just call it irrotational. Uh, at any point, if you need to pause this video, obviously go ahead and do it and then come back when you're ready. Okay, um, so to, to determine the swirl, we do curl field dot the vector v. If that's positive, it's a counterclockwise swirl at that point. If it's negative, clockwise swirl at that point. And if it's zero, then there's no swirl, or what we call a rotational. I forgot a parenthesis there. Recall back in your earlier math days that um, you probably learned in pre-calc, I would think, the dot product between two vectors, a and b, is equivalent to the magnitude of a, magnitude b, cosine theta. So if you think about that, basically what that will tell us here is that the largest magnitude of swirl would happen if curl field is parallel to V. Um, I think there's a problem, L2 on your literacy sheet that kind of has something to do with this. Uh, they call it the, the finger test, I think. And you push your finger onto a vector and you can you think about if your finger was there, what kind of swirl would it feel as a field swirled around your finger? Would it be clockwise, counterclockwise, or neither? All right, the big thing in chapter 13 is Stokes formula. So you can see here, this is Stokes formula here, basically. Um, obviously, the whole thing is Stokes formula. It's proven that they were equal, but that's the one we'll be using a lot when we do our calculations later on by hand. So when using Stokes formula, you need to choose a designated top side. The side you pick for the top side may not be the same as the side designated by the top side by the person sitting next to you. And that's just, you know, someone could choose, if, especially if it's, not, if, if it's not a flat horizontal surface and there is no top or bottom, you can pick which side is the top side. So what you pick might not be the same as someone else in the class or in general. All right, so if curl field is not equal to zero, 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 how do we calculate that, well, we basically want to use, like I said, the highlighted part there. That's usually the easiest one. Path integrals are usually easier to do than the double integrals there. Okay, we're going to do an example of that on the next page. So the example says to apply Stokes theorem to evaluate that for this given field, and R is the part of the parabolic surface, Z equals X squared plus Y squared, and below Z equals 4. So I started off here just by... Go ahead and set up my, my cross product to get my oops, sorry about that, to get my curl field there. And then I drew a picture over here. You can see the picture there and set up some equations. So the top of that figure there is x squared plus y squared equals 4. And here are my parametric equations. So we need that, obviously, for our Stokes formula. So mind the sloppy handwriting here. Just copy down Stokes formula first, and then start replacing things. So M, if you look back at our field right here, M is 3Z. Okay, so we have 3 3Z. Z is 4, dx, so the derivative of 2 cosine. 
and then n is 5x, so we have 5x dy, so derivative of 2 sine, and then p is negative 2y, so negative 2y, and then derivative of z, which is just 0. And from that point on, it's basically just your normal integration rules. So I did some simplifying here. Um, and then for this step, I use my double angle formula. I know some of you like to use the half angle formula. Same thing. It'll work out the same way. Um, so use a double angle formula there and simplified. And integrate, integrate, integrate. You get down to 20 pi. That's our final answer for that one, which is much easier than trying to evaluate that integral. So some last things, just to kind of clarify a couple of things that you might have seen in the basics or tutorials or your lessons or your triads. Uh, two curves with the same starting and ending points are path independent for a given field if the curl field is zero, 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 which is true because of Stokes' formula, which is, again is the big part of lesson 13. Uh, next here, we got given that you set up a closed curve with these two paths. If curve, curl field is zero, 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 obviously the integral would be zero which means if we were doing field at unit tan of C1 and field at unit tan of C2, they have to be equivalent, which would also, if you subtract them, would give you zero. So therefore, no matter what path you choose, you'll have the same result. Note that not each path in a row must have a value of zero. They could be anything. They'd be equivalent. So like 7 minus 7 or 12 minus 12 or whatever it would be. All right, that's it for lesson 13. Um, you guys can email me with any questions. Do your best, and uh, I will keep you updated on anything I hear about the final exam. Have a good one.